Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 22. Coming up on the show, we've got retrocausal jungle visions, E.T., blood beams, and the time loops of the muse. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. Really looking forward to this episode, and we're going to switch things up a little bit, because on the last Plus episode, you just went into the Cassiopeian experiment documents, which essentially was a group which is drawing together all these elements of paranormal phenomena and trying to understand what's going on by mixing it with, I know, channeling, right? It's basically talking to aliens through Ouija boards. Let's just sum it up. Yeah. Yeah. to what it is. But the reason why I really like them, and I'm going to give a shout out to them, to go, if you subscribe to any Substack, subscribe to these guys. I'll link to it in the show oh, notes. Oh, you've been reading it too? I've been going through it because I wanted to carry on from what we were talking about in the last show, where you were describing, what were they called? The window fallers. These are entities that seemingly show up in window areas that were described by John Keel, and they're, they're out of place. But where we went on that episode is that we started going into, well, how do they sustain themselves in this reality? How do they stay, sustain themselves on Earth and then seemingly just disappear. Yeah, here you go. You've got it brought it up on the on the uh, screen here. Um, but essentially, I've already been working on something called supernatural bloodlust, and this stuff ties in perfectly. And we may have some answers from this channel material. Now, of course, we have to take it with a grain of salt, because when it, we know that with channel material, it's highly likely you're dealing with, let's just say, nefarious entities, if you are indeed dealing with any entities at all. But there's a few little details that come up that suggest that there is something very strange going on here about entities wanting human blood. It's all got to do with the blood. It's all to do with this life force, which is which is blood. So we'll go into that at the end because I realize that, of course, we're going to go into cattle mutilations and vampirism and you know supernatural predators. It's a little bit dark. It gets a little bit intense. So I thought for the sake of the YouTube mods, we'll just leave that to the side, put it into plus. So what have you got coming up yeah, for this show? Probably safer to do that in the plus extension coming up. Yeah. I'm going to be talking about a follow-up to a book from Eric Wargo. Remember this from back in 2018? I do. Time yeah. Loops, Precognition, Retrocausation and the Unconscious. Brilliant book. Uh, Eric is a fascinating guy, very smart individual who was looking at, well, this is what we focused on when we covered in 2018, was the uh, retro causality of the universe. Loops. Yeah, the idea that uh, future events ripple out through the temporal landscape and it's possible that your consciousness can pick up on those future events. Yes. And they may play out in the form of, well, often dreams or inspiration. Well, it can also influence you. Yeah, well, he's got a brand new book out. It's, uh, let me bring it up here, From Nowhere, Artists, Writers, and the Precognitive Imagination. So this is really focusing on this idea that, well, it's a question he points out that artists hate. And it's a question that writers often get and, you know... Like, what's your muse? Yeah, all sorts of it? creative people get this question is, where do you get your ideas from? Yeah. And they hate it because it's a really often impossible question to answer. Because often the answer is, I don't know, they just kind of came. And it's intriguing because he says in the introduction that uh, if you went back, say, 300 years ago, this would be an easily answered question. It's only up until around 300 years ago that we started having difficulty with this. Was that the Renaissance? No, that was earlier. What, what happened 300 years ago? The change? Well, that? you've got the Enlightenment, really. Yeah, the, the Enlightenment, yeah. Modern scientific thinking that has become the underlying foundation of thought in our civilization. So in the past, it was believed that ideas came from your muse. They came from something supernatural. They came from something supernormal. He says the earliest cultures to write down their myths and religious texts were, they were explicit about ideas originating elsewhere than in a person's head. And the Greeks, for example, they had the muses, they had the gods, but they also had the, the daemon, the idea of this internal assistant spirit of sorts. But an objective observer of your life. Yeah, that you could tap into that would give you this inspiration. So again, this changed with the Enlightenment. Uh, natural scientists in Isaac Newton's day, they rejected any physical causation, he says, that wasn't naturalistic and uh, mechanistic. And philosophers then extended this to any kind of um, invention, any artistic uh, creation. It a, had, there had to be some mechanism behind it. There's a lot of irony in that, though, because there are rumours out there, obviously, again, this is something else that you take with a grain of salt, but that Isaac Newton was influenced by a muse, by a, a non-human intelligence. That's how he came about with the idea rather than 
you know, apparently he has, you know, said that uh, the idea seemingly came from, you know, another location. Well, he does just open to interpretation. He just says the the scientists in Newton's day, not necessarily Newton himself, although he's credited for, you know, a lot of the Enlightenment. But today he says, look, you pick up almost any academic or pop scientific article or book on creativity. And you'll find the same basic assertion. It's the idea that inspiration as being some divine or semi-divine, having some semi-divine source to it, that's just a silly, quaint old myth. There's no truth to it. What we really understand today is that the brain, all these connections of neurons sparking with electricity, the general idea is that somehow it collates all this collected knowledge that's just sitting there in the unconscious and it just bursts forth from this brain activity. But that in itself is kind of esoteric when you think about it as well. Like, I know that they're going to this very materialistic point of view, but I think they lack the realisation that suggests like a collective unconscious. Yeah, but this, the idea is it's still stored in the brain. Right. It's just sitting there in the brain. It's just the brain. The brain is the mystery. It all comes from the brain. So this idea that, again, that it's from some other source, sometimes even a divine inspiration, that's just gone, that's just silly... But what hasn't gone away, he points out, is the experiences. Mm. The experiences of writers, artists, uh, filmmakers, any kind of creative individual, they often experience what Eric terms as simply artistic prophecy. And you know, Eric, this is a very um, intellectual book in how he lays out the philosophy, uh, the physics of how this might work. He, he ventures into you know the latest in quantum physics. Uh, but what I wanted to do today was just look at those experiences, look at uh, some of the direct reports from these creative people that fly in the face of the idea that this is just your lifetime's collected knowledge and it's all bursting forth because your brain has some electrical spark. Um, and he goes through some of the best examples in the introduction that we know so well. Like the first one, of course, is... Um, What's the book from the 19th century? Futility. Futility. That, I guess. Uh, Morgan Robinson's Futility, written, of course, 14 years before the Titanic, but it just had like all... Like, there was the ship a- that he wrote about was called the Titan. The book's alternative title was The Wreck of the Titan. Uh, he described a ship which matched almost the dimensions and structure mm. of the Titanic. Uh, it also sank on its maiden voyage. Uh, it, it had the iceberg had collision. the iceberg. The demographics of the passengers That's were the right. same. The num- yeah. Although I think there were less survivors, but it was the same problem on The Wreck of the Titan mm. in that they didn't have enough lifeboats. It's uncanny. Like, it's really uncanny how this guy wrote this story and it's essentially played out 14 years later. So that's the go-to example, but he points out that's just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> the, usual, the, pun. the usual pun. Uh, another one we've heard many times is the one from Norman Mailer, who published a book called Barbary Shore in 1951. It's a novel about a writer living in Brooklyn Heights. He's in a rooming house and amongst the neighbours in this building, one of them's a KGB spy. Uh, so he published this book, 1951. He had a stint in Hollywood and eventually he moved back to Brooklyn Heights and he wanted to work on his next novel. But he was shocked to learn, he, he got a newspaper one day and it was the New York Times and he sees this headline article about this guy, Rudolf Abel, who I'll put on the screen here. He got his own postage stamp in the Soviet Union. Uh, he was a top KGB colonel who had the alias Emil Goldfuss and he'd been running a spy ring from that same building yeah. that he had written about all those years ago in 1951, and he just couldn't believe it. So again, this is this is the idea of this creative prophecy, and there's just so many amazing examples. The other one he included was Don uh, DeLaLeo from 1985. He wrote this novel called uh, White Noise, and in this novel... It's uh, about this airborne toxic event and it's caused by a chemical spill and it forces the evacuation of this small college town. And the novel, it was published only a few weeks after the Bhopal disaster in India. Oh, wow. You know, that horrible gas leak or chemical leak. Yeah, it was, um, was it like something from polyvinyl chloride gas or something like that, but it suffocated what, hundreds if not more? There was half a million people injured. Yeah. Many of them were blinded. I think it was about 8,000 people died from it. Yeah, it was something ridiculous. So he, even though this was published a few weeks after the disaster, obviously he had written it, you know, months and months before. 
Uh, so that was another example. It really lined up. Uh, the next one's from Michel uh, Hulebeck, who's this French author. He wrote this 2001 novel called Platform. I'll pop it up on the screen here. Uh, it's about a middle-aged French sex tourist in Thailand, and it culminates with this terrorist attack at the Thai resort. And in the novel, it's Islamic extremists. They drive a van filled with explosives, you know, fertilizer into the nightclub. They blow up this nightclub. 200 people are killed in the novel. This sounds very much like the Bali bombings. Yeah, exactly. One year later, you have the Bali bombings, oh. which killed a bunch of Australians. It was October 2002. An Islamic extremist group, or what are they called again? Uh, Jama'a Jama Islamia. Jama'a Islamia. They set off a car bomb in between two nightclubs, just like the novel. And this was in Bali, though. The only difference is it wasn't in Thailand. It was in Bali. And they killed 202 people. I, it was two people off the the death count from the novel. I, I've seen the forensic images of, of this, um, this particular bombing, and it was just horrific. Because what they did is they set off the bomb. There were two suicide bombers. I think two or three. It doesn't matter. But there was a suicide bomber. Uh, inside the nightclub. And of course, when he blew himself up, people went running out to the street. When they went running out to the street, of course, they detonated a truck mm. so or a large vehicle. You know, So it was like, it was, it was the way that they planned this was just truly horrible. So does that match up with the, the book? Yeah. The, the number of people died was 202 in the real event. And he wrote about 200 people dying, being blown up in a nightclub. And it, the, yeah, the only thing he got wrong was, was Thailand instead of um, Indonesia. See what? Oh, sorry. The, where was it again? So this is Bali. Bali, sorry. Yeah. yeah. See the, what what people say about these sorts of things, like the wreck of the Titan and and this kind of thing, um, is that oh well, you know, this kind of stuff is always going to happen because you've got industrial, you know, the way that our world is, you know, how we manufacture things that we have enough of it that eventually someone that's writing something, it's going to occur, it's going to line up. The issue is with so many of these reports is it's actually the fine details. It's not just like, oh, it happens to be a boat that sank. It's the fine details. It's like Wreck of the Titan is a great example, which is why you must have used it first, because it's like down to the dimensions of the vessel. He's got a chapter on the odds, on the statistics. Right. Yeah. And I just started to read it and went, oh, God, <laughs> look, so boring. <laughs> look, let's just say that the stats are there, though, right? It's more than chance. It's definitely not uh, chance, at least in most of the cases I'm going to be mentioning. The next one I wanted to talk about was this Haitian playwright. He's uh, a poet, artist. His name's uh, Frank Etienne. I think I'm getting that right. In November of 2009, he wrote the Haitian Letters. Sorry, he's called the father of the Haitian Letters, but in 2009, he wrote this play. It's called uh, The Trap. And the play centers around people trapped in rubble following a disaster that's really unnamed. It just kind of starts from them being trapped in this rubble. Anyway, on January the 12th, 2010, just minutes after he had finished his very first rehearsal of the play about these people trapped in rubble, that huge earthquake hit Haiti, that magnitude 7 earthquake killing or displacing 900,000 people. And no one knows actually how many people died in that earthquake. But it was just an incredible story because... He had basically prophes prophesied this scenario. I mean, there were obviously a lot of people trapped in rubble after that. But there's an interesting kind of side note to the story in that he survived because two days before the quake, he said he heard a disembodied voice start speaking in his mind. And it said um, to get an, a medallion of St. Andrew. That's all it said. Get a medallion of St. Andrew. And is he a patron saint for what? I think he's Safety the patron or... saint of disasters or something. Oh. But but they he asked his driver, he said, you've got to get me a medallion of this guy. You've got to get me a medallion of this patron saint. So his driver went to the neighboring city in, in Haiti uh, where this uh, Andrew is the patron saint and he ended up getting him this medallion. And that city turned out to be the epicenter of the earthquake. So there's all these weird synchronicities with the whole thing. But... Again, Eric points out this; these aren't one-offs. It's like you hear about them occasionally. And I remember we had one recently with Dean Coots. Remember during COVID? Oh, you yes. Remember this example? Yes. So he, In which book was that? He wrote The Eyes of Darkness, first published in 1981. But it's interesting because he published it under a pseudonym for some reason. And the setting was different. The setting was actually in uh, Russia. It was called the Gorky 400, the secret lab. And 
after the collapse of the Soviet Union, he republished the book under his own name and called it The Eyes of Darkness. But this time he changed the setting. He rewrote it to be in Wuhan, China. So if you you haven't seen this meme during COVID, I'm sure you have, but it was the exact same scenario as what happened in 2019, 2020. There was a secret lab uh, that had this virus that leaked out. And in both editions, the novel set in 2020. So we got the year right. It's Wuhan. (laughs) It's like... It's the SARS, some version of the SARS virus. So it was really uncanny how accurate he was. See, that kind of stuff falls into, because it's obviously more recent, it falls into this idea of predictive programming. Uh, and this is the the concept that, you know, some people suggest that uh, the powers that be, the elites, whoever they are, the government, uh, put this stuff out there into popular culture so that people aren't shocked when the actual events take place. A really good example of that is the TV show, The Lone Gunman, which came out, I think it was in either early 2001 or in 2000. And that was a spin-off series of The X-Files. And in The Lone Gunman, in one of the episodes, uh, essentially in a a group, a secretive group, uh, go to crash a aircraft into the World Trade Center. And so, and that happened, that TV show came out, you know, months before the event actually took place. And so many people suggest this is part of predictive programming. But if we're heading down the path that I think Eric might be, I wonder if it's not actually predictive programming. It's just that, because obviously TV shows are written by writers like and creative types. They're picking up on huge events from the future and it's filtering in through their work. Yeah, again, his first book, Time Loops, explored this idea that the future event is so powerful. It is literally it causing a wave. Yep. It's causing some tangible change in some... Because information, the idea is that information is a real tangible thing in another dimension. It's not just this ephemeral thought that dissipates. It sticks around. It's tacky. You can touch it and it's experience it. It's a substance, exactly. And that substance is disturbed. And the flow of time is different in other dimensions. There must be a dimension where the temporal flow is reversed. Well, it's equated to dropping a um, a large rock into a pond. Like, it's the same thing. Like, you drop it into a pond of this stuff, and what does it do? It radiates out through time. So, what he's arguing, and I'll have more examples that uh, get behind this idea later, is that it's it's not necessarily precognition the way we traditionally think about it. It's, and it's not even precognition of the event. It's the, it's, you're picking up on your future reaction to the news. A great example of that was the guy that he, what was it? Was it Krakatoa? He predicted the destruction of Krakatoa, but only because he had a dream where he read a newspaper yeah. describing the eruption. So he didn't have a dream about the eruption. He had a dream about his reaction to reading a newspaper about so many people passing away. Yeah, he even makes the arguments for remote viewing that they may not be accessing the target in real time. They may be picking up on the feedback they get in the future when they get the correct target. Oh, that makes it complicated. (laughs) It's like a complete head twister. Anyway, Mm. we'll get into that in a moment. I've got better examples. But he mentions Philip K. Dick. This is another one of the classics. And there's entire books written about uh, the synchronicities in Dick's sci-fi. He had a lot of experiences. Yeah, he had a lot of weird stuff happen to him and a lot of psychedelic experiences as well. But the one that Eric points out which I think is one of the best stories, was the animatronic Lincoln story. So this was recall that. going back to 1962. So he was in Northern California and Philip K. Dick, he wrote this story. It was about entrepreneurs building an android um, simulacrum of uh, Abraham Lincoln. And he couldn't find a publisher for it. No one wanted to touch it. So it just sat in his top drawer for years, right? And I think it was about two years later Disneyland unveiled their animatronic Lincoln and it was a huge deal back then. It was no one had seen this technology before and people were amazed by it. And so what's so weird about his story though is when he saw this Disneyland animatronic Lincoln, um, his story that he had wrote was about the inventor of this animatronic Lincoln being obsessed with um, with this relationship with a young woman in the story. And the young woman in the story, her job was to apply makeup to the android Lincoln at night, right? That's all she did. And about a decade later, Philip K. Dick was living in Orange County and he's living in an apartment building. It was actually near Disneyland. And after a while, he'd been living there and he discovered that one of his neighbours worked at Disneyland. It was a young woman 
and her job was putting the makeup on the animatronic Lincoln every night after the park had closed. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, it's a coincidence, but it's a weird coincidence. It's not a coincidence. It's It's got to be more than that. I mean, again, what Wago is pointing out is that this event was like a shocking revelation and that radiated out temporarily in reverse to him over a decade earlier where he's like, oh, gets this inspiration for the story and starts writing it down. Where did that idea come from? Is it a collection of experiences and it's just all of a sudden come out from his brain firing off electricity? Or is it from some no, temporal retrocausal way? Oh, look, I actually think that that is, is more likely only because there is sufficient evidence, you know, anecdotally, of course, that this happens to a lot of people. I mean, when you look at synchronicities, synchronicities are a great example as well because I've noticed when people describe their experiences with synchronicities, they actually don't have a synchronicity in the sense that it's like they've got a uh, like a deja vu recall of an event taking place. It's usually that their excitement of experiencing the synchronicity itself. It's like that's yeah, what that's, right. that's what makes it this big. And this sounds to be exactly the same thing, right? But you know what people say? Oh no 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 no. The brain looks for patterns. The brain always is looking for patterns. Like we're very analytical in the way that we approach things. So that you know, when you have events like mm. this taking place, your brain just slots them in so that uh, it can basically compartmentalize and memorize them. I'm like, <laughs> you're not buying it. No, of course I'm not <laughs> buying it. How absurd. <laughs> well, I want to give you my my favorite example next because I think this is kind of karmic in a way. This is a Romanian surrealist painter. I'll put him on the screen here. His name was uh, Victor Brauner. And in 1930, he painted this self-portrait where he's like blinded in one eye. That's not it. That's the Hitler one. There he is. <laughs> That's a <the> Hitler one. <laughs> <laughs> he's blinded in an eye, right? But this theme of an injured eye became a part of his work. Like he would often paint eyeballs with knives in them. And yeah, he did this 1934 painting of Hitler with a knife in the eye, um, a dagger in the eye. There's a bunch of variations of paintings where the eye is severely damaged. Is the irony here that that umbrella takes his eye out years later? Well, I was just going through his work and just look at the the god-awful paintings that he did. I mean, they're just disgusting and shouldn't exist, right? And there he is later in life. Oh. Is that a glass eye? What happened there, Victor? It looks like you got a bit of a glass eye. Well, it turned out after years of painting these dagger-in-the-eye paintings, two of his communist colleagues were having an argument about who's like visions of um, interpretist paintings were more revolutionary, right? They're having this violent fight. And Victor tries to intercede. And one of them tried to throw a glass bottle or some like a shot glass at the other painter. And it ended up hitting Victor in the eye and he had his eyeball removed as a result. Isn't that strange? Because some people would then suggest that, did he actually create this for himself by spending years focusing on it or did he was he picking up on it and he just simply was putting it into his art well you know what's kind of ironic about this is when i was looking through his personal websites well not his personal websites but just you know his biography website yeah there's this quote from him and it's a typical like you know it's a typical ultra leftist view on this revolutionary art where you're tearing down the norms and you're tearing down the traditions. He says, art draws on magic, the revolt of the will against destiny. But it looks like destiny (laughs) got its way in the end. Well, I, I don't think you can fight fate. I think whatever's meant to happen is meant to happen. So trying to, you know, laugh in its face can result in, you know, Mm terrible consequences. And then we've got the TV examples and The Simpsons is the go-to one. There's so many predictions that this, well, not even predictions, just episodes that came true, you know, episodes from The Simpsons that turned out to have really intriguing details or parallels in real life. Some of them are a bit dubious and that's where I do fall into this idea of, look, like how long has The Simpsons been around? 30 years or something? Like it's been going for 30 years. Is it not possible that they would just write a whole bunch of things that would seemingly align with events from the future, like that would make sense. Yeah, obviously some of them. It's a lot of interpretation and... Some of them are going to be close just based on chance. You know, I'm not going to rule that out. But it's the details. It's in the details. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps the next example is just one of those chance ones. It's from the Black Mirror. Black Mirror in the UK. This is a terrible episode. I remember this episode. Oh. It was from 2011. And the gist of the story is the UK Prime Minister is blackmailed. His daughter's kidnapped. Oh, no, no, no. So isn't it someone in the royal family that they're kidnapped? Some important young girl is kidnapped. Mm. And he's basically blackmailed in front of cameras to... Uh, What's, what's the term I should use? <laughs> to copulate with a pig mm. in order to save the girl's life. And, you know, it was a really kind of popular episode because it was so extreme, I guess. But four years later in 2015, enter the Daily Mail, British Prime Minister and an obscene <laughs> act with a dead pig. How David Cameron took part in sordid initiation ceremony after joining Oxford University Dining Society as a student. So what? this story came out in the tabloids that, yes... The UK Prime Minister was alleged to have done a sex act with a pig. That is weird. <laughs> because that's like the last thing, like that Black Mirror, you're right, it was such a uh, repulsive episode that it's like it's the last thing that you would imagine would happen and then it came true. But you see that all the time now. Like you see memes from five, ten years ago and they just show like this extreme ridiculous example, but today it's just normal. Yeah. <laughs> it's just... I can't think of any examples that I could say on air off the top of my head. No, there's, but plenty that we could. Plenty. Um, so you might think, again, that this is just the usual British tabloids. They put out a lot of nonsense. And obviously, you know, a broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah. They're bound to land on some future event. So why pay attention to this? Well, Eric points out that despite what you might think, this is so prevalent. These kinds of uh, creative predictions of the future that are obviously not uh, not intentional, they happen so often, they're so prevalent that some intelligence agencies have started to pay attention to this. Well, this is what people are saying about Civil War. That new the film. Yeah, the new film that's come out. Have you seen it? I haven't, no, seen, I haven't it. seen it yet, no. But this is what some people are saying, that this is part of this. It's like setting us up for Civil War, which is coming after the election in the US. But then you're going back to the whole predictive programming idea. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, he's arguing something else. He claims that in 2018, the German Defense Ministry uh, hired specialists in comparative literature from the, one of the universities to basically run like an algorithm that collected all the plots of novels from around the world, right? They, they poured every plot into this AI soft, model. software, yeah, this, this algorithm model and used it to try and predict regional conflict black swan events like 9-11. They can't even predict the collapse of their own country, and yet they're trying to do that. But you know what? It worked. Did it really? Yeah, they called it Project Cassandra, and they successfully predicted the uh, social unrest in Algeria in 2019, two years after they ran the program. There was, there was writers in that region and or other places around the world writing about that region, and their plots included this scenario in society that happened years later See, in, in real life. Do you know, he's just getting the karma for what it did. And I'm not talking about the Second World War. I'm talking about Angela Merkel naked, like those photos that came out. Yeah. That's what it's getting punished for. Did you dream about that years <laughs> before it happened? <laughs> yeah, this is a horrifying nightmare that I could never recover from. <laughs> <laughs> so Eric points out these anomalies, yeah, they might be giving us an important clue about the, the oldest of mysteries, which is the origin of ideas. Mm, mm. Where does this inspiration come from? And it's obviously different, he argues, to what the post-Enlightenment psychology would have us believe. He says, the hypothesis I will be advancing is that the most original ideas, the nuclei of novels and songs and sculptures and paintings and films, have what could be called a supernormal or paranormal origin, just as the creators have often intuited. He says, the best art and literature do not arise merely from some hammering together of available influences and cultural raw materials on some inner cognitive workbench. They come from somewhere else. And he goes into, I, I knew this one would come up, but he goes into the September 11 attacks, the World Trade Center. Uh, and he talks about how the buildings, when they opened in 1973, they couldn't fill the office space because it was just, there was so much, it was just so big. So what they ended up doing, the Port Authority, they went to the Manhattan Cultural Council, which I guess it runs all the you know artists as an umbrella for all the artists, and they got permission 
to use some of the floor space in the Twin Towers for studios, for artist studios. And so 15 artists moved their materials into what were called the aerial studios uh, in May of 2001. So are these the upper floors? Yeah, this was in the upper floors. And one of the artists that had one of these aerial studios was a Jamaican-American guy. His name was uh, Michael Rolando Richards. I'll put him up on the screen here. Uh, There he is in black and white. And he was the only one of the artists to lose his life in the attacks. Uh, He was a real night owl. So he was on the 92nd floor the night before. And he basically called his girlfriend or called his wife and said, look, I'm working so much, I'm just going to sleep in the studio tonight. And she said he often did that. Um, So he slept there. This guy was born in Brooklyn in 1963, but he was actually raised in Jamaica and he moved back to New York to go to college, uh, you know, got into the arts scene. He was in prestigious art schools in the 90s. And the thing about this guy, who probably would have seen the plane come into the town, like the second plane hit, he would have had the perfect view of it if he wasn't killed by the first one. Um, he would have had a perfect view of it. All of his art is about planes. Oh, my God. Are you kidding me? Yeah, all of his art is about planes. Do you have some of things. his art? Yeah, I've got some of it on the screen I'm going to be putting up in a moment. That it's is all about so sad. Planes and flight. It's all about crashing, planes descending. Uh, oh, my God. So this one, this is one of the first pieces I'll show you on the screen here. This is from 1998. It's called Airfall. It's, if you're just listening to the audio, it's it's basically 50 model airplanes on string and they're flying down to this target. They're about to crash into this target on the ground. But you know what that actually even looks like from an abstract view? It looks, you know, hauntingly similar to that photograph of the falling man. Yeah, like people dropping from a people distance. People falling, yeah. Yeah, and all the planes are covered in black hair for some reason. On the night before the attacks, Richards had probably been working on one of two sculptures, and I don't have images of these because they're obviously lost. There was no photos taken of them. They were lost in the towers. Uh, But he had shown them to friends and other artists. Uh, One, according to fellow artist Jeff uh, Jeff, uh, Konigsberg, was a Tuskegee airman riding a burning meteor. And you know the airman from World, the black airman from World War II. Mm Um, so yeah, they're riding a meteor, almost like a kamikaze pilot. That was one of the sculptures, but it also calls to mind, Eric points out the Tuskegee experiments. Which where, was that the syphilis experiment? Yeah, they injected syphilis, um, into black patients, um, and they weren't given- And penic- didn't tell them about it. Yeah, they weren't given a penicillin, they were given a placebo just so they could see what happened. Uh, so that also ties into, I know this is probably a spurious correlation, but the idea that 9-11 isn't exactly what we were told. That oh, I believe that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not. something else going on. It's not uh, as simple as the terrorist attack oh, story. Oh, would never lie to us. And so by mentioning the Tuskegee experiments, it ties in with this idea of, well, governments will do whatever they want to their people given yeah. the right motivation. Uh, another piece that was lost in the towers was called Fallen Angel. And this was a life-sized self-portrait of him, but he had wings on his back. One of them was broken and this brings to mind another one of his sculptures, which was done, um, yeah, it would have been like right before he died, actually. These were three Tuskegee airmen who, the idea was that they'd, they'd jumped out of the sky and they'd missed their target. And I've got an image here, but they almost look like burnt bodies, don't they? they like do. they're, they're wearing black suits. They're sitting in this black tar And it's like the whole point of the art is that they missed their target. It was too small for them to hit. Uh, So, yeah, take from that what you will. Well, they also look like people that have fallen and gone splat. Yeah. The most impressive one, though, is called Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian. And he produced this in 1999. Here it is on the screen here. And again, this is a life-size sculpture of him being penetrated by planes. By numerous airplanes. Crash. And he's standing tall and erect, almost like a tower. And this one is really kind of creepy. This is this is the one that makes you think, well, maybe he was just inspired by this future event. It was rippling back through time into his uh, conscious or subconscious mind, I should say. Well, I mean, I mean, 9-11 is, you know, one of those events that is just so 
um, at the forefront of the human experience now. It's like, you know, we talk about it in modern times, like there's basically two or three events that people go, I know where I was when I found out 9-11, the death of Princess Di, um, and I, even the, the tsunami, uh, the, the first one, the Boxing Day tsunami. That's kind of where people go, oh yeah, I remember exactly where I was when I heard that. So this event, the fact that, you know, he's there and he, like, he's putting out all this art with planes, mm. it's like, because he was directly involved, that it somehow amplify what was going to happen? Well, this, because remember, it's called, um, what's the artwork called? Like a tar Baby and St. Sebastian. So St. Sebastian is the Christian martyr. He's the patron saint of soldiers and athletes. And he's depicted in Renaissance art. I don't have an image, but uh, he's a pincushion for arrows instead of planes, right? So it's like a homage to that. It'd but, be interesting. But listen, because if you know nothing about this guy and how he lost his life, you would think, okay, yeah, this is still a pretty interesting piece of art. But- once you know how he died and the fact that 2,800, Wago says, other people in the Twin Towers were literally martyred by planes, mm. that brings it into a whole new perspective. He's painting this Christian martyr in a way where all these other people were martyred by airplanes. So the, he says he's kind of like an author of the a sculptor of the impossible. Well, it'd be interesting to know whether or not his studio was at one of the floors where the planes penetrated as well. Because well, like, th that's unknown. We don't know if he would have survived that first impact, but yeah. if he did, he would have had a perfect view of the second plane hitting. And either of those events would be, this is the idea, the events that rippled back through time to affect his inspiration and affect his, his thinking throughout his career as he was leading up to this fateful event. Look, it's pretty uncanny. I mean, obviously this is open to interpretation and you could go, oh, well, it's just a coincidence, but it's too much here, Ben. It's too much that it's more than just simply a coincidence. Well, this is where Eric goes into some of the science that is backing this up now. And he talks about in the last two decades, this assumption that this teleology has no place in natural law has been breaking down. Physicists are now talking about retrocausation as an explanation for some of the mysteries of quantum mechanics. He says, for example, there's experiments at the University of Rochester in 2009 where they had two halves of a split laser. Um, the laser beam went to two different sequences of measurements. The results seem to show, he wrote, that a certain type of final measurement amplified one halves of the beam in the past. Yeah. <laughs> so again, this weird, spooky, retrocausal action in the lab. He says several research teams have lately shown that the temporal se sequence of a computation can be reversed in a quantum computation circuit. I don't know how that, like, how do you even wrap your head around that? How do you get a It's the kind of thing that, that just is, like, you just have to accept it. Like, a computational result can be reversed. Like, how does that even work? How would you even measure that? There, there was an experiment that was con being conducted as well, and I can't recall who conducted this experiment, but it was very similar to what you were describing with the lasers, but they were firing particles through something. And it was like the particle would go through as a um, as either a wave or as a particle, right? And as it was going through, but what was happening is that the observer was making interpretations. So the guy that the- Yeah, that's the like, old, the slit experiment. No, that's... but wasn't there something, there was something different where they were making guesses. And so when they made a guess, the actual um, particle or the wave would change based on the guess that was made by by the person making the guess. So it was like they were influencing the experiment, like the outcome of it. Yeah, this, this is a little bit different. You're, you're talking about the consciousness of the observer changing the- Oh, is that what quantum, The quantum mechanics. Yeah. Um, but it's, I guess it's related- uh, what what he's discussing in terms of the advancements in quantum computing is that theoretically you could build a quantum quantum computational device that would enable you to observe those future events because you can reverse the quantum temporal flow. So you could essentially have an incredible prediction machine that's picking up on those future events that are rippling out through time, so going backwards in time. You're telling us the chronovisor is real. Yeah, you could build a chronovisor. He says uh, such devices may have time-defying properties and one day may be used as, again, predictive tools, but even communication devices across time. So That's you could cool. have a discussion with Aaron in the future and be like, all right. Buy lots of Bitcoin well before 2017. Give me the top 10 list of disaster investments that I made. <laughs> And I'll change them. 
right? So basically every investment I've yeah. ever made. Give me your top 10 mistakes and I'll see if I can uh, fix it. So, uh, yeah, he talks about other advancements, which I won't go into, that suggest the these quantum, you know, what's the word to use? The... Uh, the opposite temporal functions are also appearing in um, living systems. Like they're starting to detect it in photosynthesis, in uh, the enzymes that break down molecules, in the human brain as well. These same principles of um, this uh, quantum temporal sequencing. Well, you got something there, though. The fact that this is happening in the human brain, does that mean that the materialists may begin to accept through quantum physics that maybe they are like these creative people or all of us right but in this context of what we're describing they are actually picking up on the future because of a brain function i i just don't like it on instinct because it's just another materialist explanation it but just what's... goes back to the well it's your brain is actually quantum yeah i see yeah. <laughs> although you know i don't i don't necessarily have a problem with that the problem i have with the entire approach to that is i feel like it's unnecessarily skeptical and it removes any possibility of of wonder like well, it removes any spiritualism my issue with it is that the human being is a soul we're yes, non-physical yeah. and the brain is just this physical computation device that interprets the signals it's from, a receiver from the soul from the mind that is not physical mm. and so you don't even need the brain we know this from out of body experiences near death experiences you can receive the information without the meat body without the brain yeah without the human body at all. Well, how many times have we looked at those stories of people that, you know, they've had brain scans and it turns out that they've got, you know, encephalitis and have hardly any brain tissue at all. It's like a thin layer and yet they're still completely normally functioning. And people don't understand why. Like science, I mean, when I say people, scientists don't understand how is it possible that their brain is full of water yeah. and yet they're functioning. So I feel like digging too much into what the brain does is a bit of a dead end, but that's just me. There might be something there. Uh, he gives a few recent examples of how this is becoming much easier to talk about and the taboo of these precognitions is kind of vanishing. He gives a couple of examples of uh, authors recently doing NPR interviews. There was uh, Ayad Akhtar who wrote this novel about American Muslims in the aftermath of 9-11. Um, he was on NPR and he spoke about this dream that he wrote into the novel and he admitted, it's funny because he says that the interviewer didn't expect him to answer the question. He asked something like, you know, is this a real dream that you wrote into your novel? And he just said, yeah, like two days before 9-11, I had this dream of people running through New York City, scattering like ants because like their hive had been destroyed and everyone was in a panic. And then, yeah, two days later, the attacks happened. <laughs> Excuse me. Then there was another one from... This novelist, uh, Danny Shapiro, again, she was on NPR and she wrote about this uh, novel. She wrote a novel called Signal Fires and it's about this friendship between a retired doctor, his name's Ben Wilf, and this lonely 11-year-old boy named Waldo Schenkman who lived across the street. And uh, she said the novel started in her head, just again, out of nowhere, this idea comes to this novel in 2007. She gets this image of an older man, this doctor, standing uh, at the window of his home, watching this boy across the road who's obsessed with astronomy look up into the sky. And she wrote this from this vision. She wrote this whole novel from this vision. And she set it aside and kind of finished writing it a decade later. But she said, I, I began the book 15 years ago, but seven years after starting it, she said, I discovered that my father who raised me wasn't my biological father. She discovered she'd been ado adopted. And so she eventually learns the identity of her biological father. And she discovers that this character she wrote about, this man in this novel she wrote, you know, 15 years earlier, everything about him was identical to her biological father who she just found out about. Yeah, that's strange. His appearance, his profession, his interests, his age, where he lived, the type of house he had, it was all in her book. And again, it just came in this flash. So we return to this idea, the shock of her discovering, what, I'm adopted? Wait, who's my biological father? 
this shock radiates oh, out. That's what caused her to get the information. And it's picked up as this moment of inspiration in the past. She's like, oh, this is an idea. Let me start writing that down. Where this also occurs in other circumstances is the shock of people finding out that they have identical twins, right? And that there's stories out there of identical twins that, for example, will end up marrying the same woman, having the same number of kids, but the, the woman will have the same name, the kids will have the same name, uh, they'll work in the same industries, they'll have drive the same cars. And it's like... They follow these paths that are identical, and yet they didn't know about each other. But then they find out later on that they exist, and it's like, oh, weird! Like all these weird coincidences. But I'm like, I wonder if it's like a genetic determinism. Like, well, that. But I wonder if it's also like some type of subconscious thing where the shock of like realizing, hey, all these coincidences, it somehow permeates out mm. through your life and then causes you to go in a certain direction. Well, I'll give you another example of this shock radiating back. Uh, there's a great story he includes from Upton Sinclair. You know that famous author. I'm not sure. This is like 1920s. Uh, he had a, his wife Mary Craig Sinclair. I'll put him up on the screen. Mm -hmm. There he is. There she is. Uh, one morning in 1928, and her her name's Mary Clay Craig, but they just call her Craig. That was her nickname. Uh, so Craig, in 1928, suddenly out of the blue, she just gets this incredible idea to write a story. It just takes over her mind. She's like, I've got to write this down. And she just starts scribbling down in a flash the synopsis of this story. And she's so consumed by it when her uh, husband, husband Upton comes home. He's like, oh, hi, honey. I brought you some lunch and, you know, let's sit down. And she's like, shut up. I'm writing. I'm in the middle of a story. It's incredible. Leave me alone. He's like, all right, all right. So he sits down and he just sits at the kitchen table and eats lunch by himself. Anyway, he had brought home two volumes of uh, novels for her. And because he was a famous writer, people from all over the world sent him their books all the time. And most of the time he was like, bin it. <laughs> he just wasn't interested. But this person had sent him um, some novel. It was some guy in South Africa who wrote a novel about like black magic and witchcraft. And because his wife was interested in psychic stuff, he's like, oh, I'll keep that for Craig and, you know, I'll take it home to her and she can have a look later. So he puts these books on the kitchen table and he keeps eating his lunch. Anyway, she walks in and she's like, honey, I need to tell you about this story. It's just the most amazing story. I just have to tell you. And he's like, I need you to sit down and calm down and eat your lunch because you're a little bit wacko right now. She's like, okay, fine. So she sits down, she starts eating the sandwich and she just idly picks up one of these books that he had brought home for her. And she just opens a random page, right? And she looks down to the bottom of the page and it's the start of a new paragraph and it just says in all caps, black magician. And she starts reading the first couple of lines. And she's like, oh. <gasps> And she goes back to the start of the chapter and starts reading the start of the chapter. It's exactly what she's been writing. It's the exact same story. The only thing that's different is her story is set in London, but this guy's story was set in Johannesburg, but everything was the same. It was about this hypnotist that was using his powers to try and seduce this woman and he became this black magician. She'd basically got written down the whole story. And reading that later on caused the shock. So what she was writing down was anticipation of the shock that was to come. Yeah. And remember, she gets the shock and then she goes back to the start of the chapter of this novel and starts reading it. And that then radiates back through time. And But he points out that they never got that. Like they thought that it was telepathic, that it was maybe psychometry, that she had yeah. somehow picked up the story or picked up the book. No, and no, this is involving time somehow. But that doesn't make sense because she wrote the story before she even touched the book. Yep. He said, um, when the most marvelous idea came over her for a story about an evil hypnotist, it didn't occur to the Sinclairs that this mechanism could potentially explain all successes in their previous experiments as well because they had done all sorts of um, psychic experiments together. Like she was doing remote viewing in the 1920s with her husband where he would sit at work and he would sketch something and she would sit at home like bored housewife try and pick up the sketch. And they often had success with these telepathic well, experiments. We know that remote viewing is real. Like it, it, it does seemingly work. But, but Eric, to the level of accuracy. Eric argues that even in remote viewing successes, you have to take in the temporal aspect, which could be that the remote viewing success, like, oh, I got that right. Is that enough. is radiating that shock of getting it right is radiating back through time. So when you're actually doing the remote viewing, you're picking up on your future self 
getting the hit. And so, that's but, what gives you the information. When I think about um, some of the remote viewing experiments that were conducted in the 60s and 70s, you know, by the US government, I mean, a really good example, of course, is that that huge uh, Russian submarine, right? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, American engineers said there's no possibility that they could engineer such a submarine. But that was decades between the remote viewing that took place and then the confirmation that that submarine actually existed. So if it's going to be that effect occurring in remote viewing, <clears throat> is that suggesting that, like it can par- like it can penetrate decades. Yeah, he's suggesting that the success of that future hit again from that remote viewer, the emotional response to them getting it right radiated back through time to the point when they were doing the remote viewing session and that's what enabled them to get the information. So I wonder <laughs> if you're it's it's you're actually a better remote viewer at the beginning than you are at the end because once you start remote viewing and getting hits then you become kind of bored with it. I don't 100% buy this idea. I think it might be responsible for some instances. Yeah, I think that's more likely. But I think he's really put all his eggs into one basket and I think it's a mistake. Yeah, I agree. Um I think there is some uh, real-time ability that isn't explained by this retro causality. Although it is it is a really intriguing idea. And again, he's got great examples. Like Elizabeth Cron is another one. So she got struck by lightning in 1988. And after she got struck by lightning, she started to have these crazy dreams. And the dreams were always of disasters, like plane crashes, you know, volcanoes, like horrible things happening. And she eventually got so many of these dreams that she thought, I need to start documenting these. So she'd wake up from a dream, she'd go to her computer, and she'd immediately send an email to herself with all the details from the dream. So she had the time, send date of the email. I thought that was a great way to do it. And let me just mention three of the dreams she had. So January the 15th, 2009, she wakes up from this dream of an American jet landing in the water somewhere in New York, and she gets the vision of all these people standing on the wings waiting to be rescued. The very next day, it was actually six hours later, remember Sully? Yeah, of course, yeah. Sully lands, what, like, you... Hudson, wasn't it? The the US Airways flight into the Hudson, he makes that miraculous landing. And if you look at the images from the media, I should have put some on the screen. Oh, we all know them, though. Yeah, you saw people lining up on the wings... As waiting the plane was to floating. get rescued. And she even said what I saw in the dream was exactly what you saw in the newspapers, in the, you know, the viral clips online. Uh, another dream she had was February 2015. She has a dream of um, a plane with propellers crashing into the ocean somewhere in Asia. And the wing is like pointing all the way up. The Taiwan crash. And yet that was the Taipei yeah, plane crash. Is it like half a day later and it matched her dream? And the image of the crash went viral. And that's exactly what she saw. It's exactly what she saw in her dream. So this is an interesting detail. She doesn't dream of being the person in the crash or the pilot or an an eyewitness. She dreams of seeing the video on YouTube. Mm. That's what appears in her consciousness. Um, And then another one was this flight from Buenos Aires to Barcelona. It's about to crash into the Atlantic Ocean. And she remembers all the details of the crash. And specifically, there's this detail. In the dream, she's comforting two Dutch passengers. And she's like, oh, it's all right. Everything's going to be fine. You're okay. The next day, a crash matching her dream occurred. No survivors. Zero survivors. But about a week later, she reads this article about the crash. And the article has this huge section. It's like an interest piece. It's probably like a Dutch source. And they're writing all the details about this Dutch couple that died in the crash. And she's reading this article. So she had like psychically been tending to them? No. I mean, yeah, that would be one way to look at it. But no, I think in this woman's case, Eric's hypothesis may be correct. What she's actually responding to psychically is, yeah, the shock from hearing the news about this, but also reading the article. Yes, it's more detailed. The key thing about this, which he he goes into a lot of detail in this in the book, is the imagination when you read something. Like when you read an article or you see something online, maybe less so, but when especially when you're reading something. You create it in your mind. You're forming the pictures in your mind. Yep. You're you know, you're creating this real example of the the words on the page and yes. it's forming something real. And that's what he claims she's picking up on in this retrocausal fashion. She's picking up on her imagination as well 
in watching the story, reading about the story, right, hearing so, about it for the first time. So the case about that, well, the you know the interest piece about that couple, like she obviously would have been formulating like feeling bad for them because you would like you read about you know a couple happy couple that was on honeymoon or whatever, yeah. and like you create that in your mind, you know, you feel bad for them. So that's why she dreamt that she was comforting them. And it also, it, you could see how it would take the form of a dream. Like if you watch a movie or you play too much of a video game, sometimes you go to sleep yeah, and you have in. you have dreams about it. Yeah. It's like it's the same thing's happening. It's just the flow of time is reversed. Mm. She's having the dream before she sees the movie. <laughs> you, need, you need to watch Out of Range. I know that you didn't really oh, get into I can't it. Stand that I know. Show. I really enjoyed oh my it. God. I, it's really good. I'll put it on if I want to go to sleep tonight. It's it's really good. Like it actually gets in. the second series obviously focuses more on they what's going on. They made a second like, yeah, season. Second, of it's that just show. come out. It's it's really great. But it basically is looking to this idea that that time is a river. Like time is this actual substance and that, you know, it's far more malleable and well, in, a, in essence, liquid than we really understand. And it can, and it's a physical thing. Like you can actually tap into time. The river of time. The river of time. Yeah. Do they still have that big hole in the TV yeah, show? Yeah, that, that's, the that's the whole crux of the entire series. I just love a, a TV show about a big hole. <laughs> really kept me on the edge of my seat, that big hole. It the is, star it, of the show is a big hole. It gets better. It gets better. Because you, I must say, in the first series, you don't really understand what's going on. Like, you're not given much at all as to what's going on. But then the second series kind of then makes it clear. Okay, I'll definitely not watch that later. Um, <laughs> so, Werner Herzog, legend, right? Super weird. <laughs> He's a super weird guy. Makes a lot of weird documentaries. But he got his start it's actually a fascinating story. 1960s, Munich. Uh, t- he's a teenager, right? And he's visiting a, a friend. And his friend is on the phone to his girlfriend. And Werner is just sitting there like, come on, dude, get off the phone with your girlfriend. Like, let's go have a beer or something. And he's so bored. His friend had um, all these books. He had a large book collection. And Werner just goes over to the bookshelf and just grabs a random book. And the book is this captivating story about this conquistador and his name is uh, Lope uh, de Aguirre and Aguirre's story, it's kind of like the ultimate heart of darkness story. So Aguirre was this conquistador and he took over the command of this expedition in the Amazon. This is like you know 16th century or whenever the conquistadors were there. In the search for gold, obviously. Yeah, and he killed his commanding, off- commanding officer, he murders him he kills any disloyal soldiers and he just basically takes over command of this company. And he is on the search for El Dorado. He's convinced he's going to find the lost city of gold. And with this gold, he's going to take over the Spanish governments that have been set up in the Americas and he's going to control the entire country. Like he's going to control the entire continent, right? It's this crazy story. Um, In the story, he ends up like murdering everyone. Even his 15-year-old daughter is with him on this crazy trek through the jungle. And I think she ends up getting killed. Either he kills her or she dies in some accident. I don't know the full story. And I haven't actually seen the movie because this story moved Werner Herzog so much. He just thought about it for years. It This never left him, this story. He was so impacted by it. Anyway, years later... He's on a bus trip to Italy with his soccer team. And he's just sitting there staring out the window and he's just hit by this drive to write the script for this movie about this story of this conquistador Aguirre. And he just starts scribbling it down in almost in this altered state just scribbling this story down. The soccer team's like, yeah, la, 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 like dancing, but hasn't going he crazy just around him. read the book? So he's just- No, this is like a decade earlier he had read the book. But he's just basically rewriting the story that he's read from a decade earlier, isn't that? No, he's story? writing a screenplay for a movie. Right, okay. He's not rewriting the story. This, he's writing a movie about this guy's story and he's just consumed by it. It's just the muse takes over and he's page after page after page. And it gets to the point where- his team had won and one of his teammates was celebrating and then just threw up all over the the manuscript. He lost two pages of the manuscript, but anyway, he kept writing it. And so he writes this screenplay. And in the script, part of the story was uh, Aguirre and his soldiers, they're 
nearly at the end of their journey, right? And they come across something incredible in the jungle. And it's a ship, it's like a galleon or something that is perched in the treetops. And it's way higher than floodwaters could have possibly put it there. Like, it doesn't make sense. It almost looks like it's dropped from above. And in this screenplay he wrote, uh, Aguirre and the Conquistadors, they're just, they can't figure out what this is. It's like the devil the devil it. has put this ship there. Uh, they climb the trees to investigate. And hanging off this galleon is a single, um, like, rowboat. It's hanging off by ropes and it's just kind of dangling there in the jungle. And it's just this crazy scene. It's not in the original story, obviously. He just added this in in the screenplay as this kind of wild random thing that happens. They find this impossible ship marooned in the canopy of the jungle. Anyway, he gets funding, he gets the green light, and he starts filming this. So he goes to the jungles of Peru. He says as soon as he lands in Peru, the jungle, and not uh, Nepal, by the way, this is definitely mm. Peru this Are you time. sure? <laughs> Little uh, plus joke there. He, um, he gets to the jungle and he realizes this jungle is exactly what I saw in my vision when I was writing the script on the bus with the soccer team. Like everything around him, the way the the ferns and the plants and the location, he's like, this is exactly how I envisioned it. And he starts to film. He was so gung-ho about this movie to get it done. He stole a 35 mil camera from some university back in Germany. But when he was interviewed about it later, he says, uh, you know, I, I never thought about it as stealing. It's, it's like he he alludes to the idea that he had some kind of like divine right to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> that or he was possessed. He had some kind of karmic right to make this movie, so he just took the camera. Anyway. If he gave it back, then we were like, okay. Well, he starts filming this, and I just want to play you the trailer because it's a classic. I mean, I, I've i never watched the whole film, but I've just seen so many clips of this online. Uh, I think I will actually watch it tonight because it's considered a classic. Here's a little snippet from the trailer that's dubbed in English. The original's obviously in German. Let's take a listen. Oh, what have I done there? Anyone who even thinks about deserting this mission will be cut up into 98 pieces. Those pieces will be stamped on until what is left can be used only to paint walls. Whoever takes one grain of corn or one drop of water more than his ration will be locked up for 155 years. If I, Aguirre, want the birds to drop dead from the trees, then the birds will drop dead from the trees. I am the wrath of God. The earth I pass will see me and tremble. Cuckoo. He's breaking the fourth wall there. He's a little bit crazy, this mm -hmm. guy. So apparently the main actor, I can't remember his name, the lead, it's Werner's pal. And he said that that's just how he is in real life. Like, Intense. <laughs> he's just like, he looks like he's snapped weeks ago for real in the jungle and he's just filming this movie like he actually believes he is this conquistador and it is like the 16th it's century a, it's or something. a little bit wrath of Khan <laughs> <laughs> like it is full like he, it's full on heart of darkness he loses the plot my favorite scene is this one where he has a face like he's just about McFucking had it like he's in this jungle he's sticky he's covered in bug bites I don't blame him and there's this guy just playing a flute I just love this scene look at his face <laughs> <laughs> he's just at it it's the best. This is literally you if we went on a jungle expedition. This is you, Ben. Dude, this is me waiting for the bus in the morning. <laughs> Just like, oh. Well, you do live near Noosa. There's a lot of characters like that around with pan pipes. It's Just had it. It's just had it with everything. I love that scene. So, but yeah. What's the, the point? Well, the filming, yeah, the filming goes on. And midway through the filming... That um, actress that was playing the 15-year-old, the daughter of the main character, uh, she had a chaperone. You know, she was well looked after on the set. But halfway through filming, he gets word from her parents that they're like, no, she has to come back home. We're taking her off this project. This was a mistake. And Werner Herzog is like, this is going to ruin us. I can't 
go back and refilm everything with a new actress, I've got to fix this. So got to kill her off? No, it's like, no, he has to. But convince- as a character, not her. <laughs> what are you talking about? Yeah, he takes her <laughs> into the jungle and murders her and that fixes all his problems. Problem solved. Everyone's killed. <laughs> no, psychopath. He gets on a plane and goes to Lima to convince the parents to keep her in the movie. Okay? Right, okay. Anyone. Well, the reason why I asked that is because you said in the screenplay earlier that, that he went crazy and that he may have killed his daughter or his daughter may have been killed. That's the main character. That's not, oh, that, I that's see. not the director. Right, okay. So, Werner, he gets on a plane, he flies to Lima, and he's very persuasive. He convinces the parents he's to... Just, he's just like, nine! Yeah, he convinces them to keep their daughter in the production. But anyway, now they're in Lima and they need to go back to Cusco and then go back to the jungle to continue filming. And at the time, everyone's trying to get on flights for the Christmas holidays, right? So he's he's there, he's with his wife, he's with his crew, and they desperately need to get back to Cusco. If you'll just he, excuse me, for, I'm sorry, but this studio, I know it's a bit of a thing, this studio is so hot. <laughs> it's like, yeah, go it's turn like, it down. It's like it's fine. I'm fine, but um, yeah, if you're feeling hot, turn it down, bro. Start talking about the Peruvian jungle and he's like, oh my God, <laughs> Aaron's face. This is Aaron's face in the studio. That's me on the pan pipes and that's Aaron leaning against the tree. Just <laughs> fucking had it. It's fucking hot again. <laughs> Imagine you're just sitting there in that armor. Now that's you in the cage there. Just had it. <laughs> Dude, if you get hot, just turn it down. Sorry to interrupt. So he's so desperate to get back to filming. He bribes someone to get seats for him and his wife and the entire crew on this flight. It's flight uh, 508, Lancer flight 508. But at the last minute, they're all set to go. They're getting ready to put their gear on the plane. The airline announces that they're changing the itinerary. They're not, in fact, going all the way to Cusco. They're only going about halfway to some other airstrip. So he's like, oh, great. We can't get on the plane, guys. Get the equipment off. You know, we can't go there. Let's try and get the next flight. So anyway... They miss Flight 508. Flight 508 disappears over the jungle of Peru. It flies into a storm, disappears off radar. It's gone. Immediately, the authorities send out the search planes, huge search party. That This is the middle of the jungle. Ten days of searching. All 93 passengers on board are presumed dead. Don't tell me it's found later on up in the treetop somewhere. Well, there was this incredible epilogue to this story. I think it was about a week or 10 days later, this young girl looking like a demon, like her eyes are bloodshot, she's got wounds, she's covered in maggots. She walks into this village in the Amazon after walking for miles and miles and miles and she's the single survivor of this flight. You might know the story. This is Julianne uh, Kopke. And oh, yes. Yeah, didn't she fall out of the aircraft when it broke up in midair? She was 17 years old. Mm. She survived the crash. She fell two miles out of that plane. She was How conscious. She, she was conscious the whole way down. But because she'd been brought up in the rainforest, she somehow survived the impact. She was still strapped to her seat. And uh, she knew that if she followed the waterways out, she would eventually come to a village. And that's what happened. Uh, and the villagers helped her get get rest and get medical treatment and get back to civilization. So this is an incredible part of the story because like you just asked, well, how did she survive? Well, they said that because she was still trapped into her seat and because of the nature of the seat she was on. You know those seed pods that when they fall to the ground, they kind of spin like a helicopter blade? Yeah, yep. Um, the propeller seats. Yeah. That's it, what they're called. They claim it would have been like that. The physics of her fall in the seat would so have, it would have slowed, s- her down. slowed the descent. And also the updraft of the storm system would have slowed her a little bit more. But you know what they said? That the seat she was on acted like a boat. And when she hit the canopy of the forest, and she even, you know, described it looking like broccoli as she was coming down. When she hit the canopy... Because it was so thick. Because it was so thick, it acted like a boat. And she just kind of came down like she was on a boat. Now, where she came down was two rivers away from where Werner was shooting his film. And he was so close to being on that flight. Yeah, it's weird. If they hadn't it's changed that so itinerary, weird. him and his entire crew would have been on that flight. We never would have got this weird movie. 
But think about it for a second. He's inspired on this bus with his soccer team to write this story about this conquistador. But he adds this crazy detail of them finding a ship in the canopy yeah. and coming out of this ship that's somehow in the canopy, like it's fallen from the sky, is robot. this single boat. And it's exactly like this idea that Eric's been talking about. It's this retrocausation, this event that would have affected him because, you know, he, he came so close to death. Maybe it was in his fate, but some twist, he avoided it. It's radiated out through time, and that's what inspired him to write the but screenplay. A, a story like this, you know, is obviously is, is truly incredible. Um, but I was just thinking before about, you know, governments attempting to use it to make predictions. It's still too vague. It's too, there's no way that you could work, like the actual working out of that event. So what I'm trying to say is it's almost pointless in using it for you predicting your future because it doesn't give you a location. It doesn't give you like a good example, like the um, one described with 9-11 with the, the ant mound collapsing and the ants running around. It's like it afterwards, it's like it, it's definitely is retro in the sense that when you see the event and you get the shock, mm. but you also can interpret and go, oh, this, this, and this all makes sense. It all lines up. But anything before the shock even though you may have that information, it's almost like you can't decode it. It's like it's being sent back encrypted. Well, if you want to revisit the idea of an algorithm crunching the data, you've got to think in terms of big data. So you you go beyond one screenplay. You know, you're talking about hundreds of screenplays, thousands of blog posts, you know, thousands of novels all being fed into an algorithm that's crunching the details to try and make some prediction. Even then, so yeah, you I'll get enough. To... Yeah, details are vague, but you get enough vague details. A picture might start to form. Mm. Uh, whether they could do anything with it, I don't know. Whether the German Ministry of Defense could action anything from that system, but at least they tried to do it. Uh, but what's weird is that decades later, Herzog tracked down this girl. She ended up changing her name because she was just so, you know abused by the press, not yeah. abused, but she was constantly followed by the Harassed. press. Um, and he ended up convincing her, he's a convincing guy, he convinces her to make a documentary. It's called Wings of Hope. The full version's on YouTube, I'll link to it in the show notes, but it was funny, I was skimming through it today, it's like an hour and ten minutes long, and I just, the very first place I dragged to in the timeline of the film was her talking about dreams. Let's take a listen. Just before I awoke from my deep unconsciousness, I had two strange interwoven dreams. In one, I was flying around like crazy in a dark room. I kept dashing along the inside of the walls, and I heard a booming, roaring noise in my ears, as if I myself was equipped with an engine. In the other dream, I had the urgent need to wash myself, because I felt completely dirty. I had the feeling that my entire body was sticky and soaked with mud. I now really need to take a bath. And then I thought in my dream, well, it's so simple, you just get up and walk over to the bathtub. It's not far. And the very moment I resolved to do this, I woke up and found myself under the row of seats, completely drenched and covered with mud and earth. The rain must have poured down all night long. So when I first saw that, I thought, oh, she's talking about a prophetic dream. But no, it's when she had mm. hit the ground, she was under the seats. So the final example I want to leave you with, just to nail this home, is something we all know well, which is the, the 1976 image of the Viking orbiter revealing for the first time to the world... Oh, the Sidonia stuff. The is face it? on Mars. Mm. So this really caused a, a huge uh, response in the public. People were fascinated by this. NASA re decided to release the image a day after they'd taken it because they thought it would uh, increase the interest in space travel in, in NASA. Yeah. And the, the way they worded it was, here's a, a strange mountain where the shadows make it look like a face. They didn't say it was a face, but everyone looks at this and they're like, there's a face on Mars, ancient civilization. And this just exploded. We had Richard Hoagland come out of this, all these theories about ancient warfare, that there was some ancient race on Mars. Maybe it was human beings and we came to Earth and our home planet was destroyed. Like all this crazy stuff came out of this. It became a real meme. But in the 1950s, 
several people predicted this event in their fiction writing, in their creative works. Really? So the first one was Jack Kirby. I'll just mention him briefly. Like Marvel Comics legend. He's the co-creator of most of the well-known Marvel characters like Thor and I think Spider-Man and, you know, all the all the Hulk. He's one of the main guys that created all these characters. But in 1959, he wrote this story called The Face on Mars. And I've got an image of it on the screen here. And it's about astronauts who go to Mars and they discover this massive stone face, this ancient structure in the desert of Mars. Upon reaching Red Planet made discovery of startling nature, initial study of object analysed. And that's the face. The weird thing about this this detail, well, the detail from 1959, remember the whole face on Mars created this discussion of, well, the people there, they were destroyed by... Nuclear war, nuclear war, some kind of warfare. This became a meme in the culture. In his 1959 comic, one of these astronauts gets close to the structure and gets a telepathic message, a hologram transmission beamed into their mind that an interplanetary war laid place to laid, laid waste to the planet, sorry, deep into the past. So they had some kind of war with Earth in the past. And we wiped them out based. Oh, there's, there's a Bigfoot planet, wasn't it? So they, they <laughs> deserved the, it. They the had it coming. Wookie, the famous yeah. Wookiee War. But this guy wasn't the only one. So the final example I want to leave you with is Isamu Noguchi. This guy was a Japanese-American sculptor. He was an artist. And in 1947, so this is three decades, at least nearly three decades before that Viking orbiter image of the face on Mars... He created this one-foot square sand model, and it was basically a proposition for this gigantic uh, art installation he wanted to do somewhere in a desert, somewhere in the world, possibly in America somewhere. He called this sculpture, Sculpture to be Seen from Mars. Omi Kekka. What is, what is that? Is that the... That's the sculpture. <laughs> Are you serious? It's it's almost like if you take away the cartoonish look on it, it looks just the structure of the photograph, the color, the composition looks identical to the face on Mars. It's, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit weird. Is like, it? I mean, it's 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 obviously like a um a, a clownish kind of representation. Like it seems quite silly, but. You can see, like, even you're right, the composition and the even the coloring, even though it's just black and white, but the way yeah. that it's done, it's got this uncanny similarity. Now, his sculpture was never built. And what we're seeing on the screen here is all that we have left of it, which is an archival photograph that's in the, you know, his museum's archives, wherever they're kept in, well, they're in Long Island, actually. Mm -hmm. But it does look astonishingly similar to the Viking orbiter's photograph. And I'm just going to AB it there. Like, isn't that uncanny? It's pretty uncanny. Yeah. And it, yet, even like the shadow, even though it's much smaller, but just the, the shadow of the nose in the direction, the even way that the sun is is facing, like it all is very similar. The shadow of the nose. Look, look at it. Is, it's wild yeah. how similar that is, right? I'll put this image in the show notes for those of you listening to the audio, but uh, when you take a look at the show notes, you'll be blown away. So, I mean, this could be that um, from one perspective, that for whatever reason... Um, like so many people focused on this that it somehow created this pareidolia later on, but that doesn't seem to be the case. It's well, more likely. You know why his whole reason for wanting to create this sculpture was? What? He wanted to leave something behind that would show the cosmos that human beings had been on this planet. Which is what the whole argument was about. After we were wiped out by some kind of nuclear war or some planetary yeah. destroying disaster just like the meme that appeared 30 years later from the viking orbiter so this plays into the whole idea that what the creative people are picking up on doesn't have to be a real event it can be a meme because obviously nasa took other photos in the 90s of that face location of cydonia and it certainly it look like it. didn't look like a face after yep. that. It's just like a mountain range. <laughs> like yep. it's, it's probably not a face at all. Uh, and that was made pretty clear. So he wasn't picking up on some real thing on Mars. 
He was picking up on a meme. But all this stuff, like, you know what the common thread is here? It's human consciousness. Because it's not picking yeah. up on the event, it's picking up on the emotion. Yeah. It's picking up on the energy of that emotion. And it's not the brain. No, no, no. It's, 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 this sum, it's consciousness. It's not brain. It's not the brain. It's not the, the physical you know, substance. It is some type of energy, or, which is what we're going to talk about in the plus extension with this idea of human energy being consumed by supernatural predators. Like it's, it's maybe the same kind of thing, like this energy that powers us that allows us to have precognition and have telepathy in these experiences. Maybe there are species that actually can recognize this and yeah. prey upon us. Connects to this idea that our thoughts and emotions in other dimensions are an actual substance. They're a substance. They're, you can touch them. You can eat them. Voison. <laughs> Voison. Voison. Oh, you found more info on Voison. I Poison. found more info on cool. Voison. Cool. Well, that's coming up for Plus. If you want to check out Eric's book, uh, I'll link to it in the show notes, of course. His first one was uh, Time Loops, highly recommended. But the new one is From Nowhere. He's artists, quite clever, isn't he? Yeah, artists, writers, and the precognitive imagination. It's a huge book, and I'm really just picking out the stories. But he's got a ton more stories in there. But the discussion around what it means and the ideas he's bringing forward about retro causality, the nature of time, the nature of consciousness, really fascinating, highly recommended. So definitely check that out. Mm. Can't wait for the stuff coming up in Plus. Blood and lots of it. Only to be kept in our Plus extension. Yeah, look, it's not, not for YouTube. It's, it's not as horrible as it sounds, but I do go, oh, there's a couple of gruesome images that come up and it does get a little bit horrible. And uh, it turns out, though, that uh, if you're a vegan, look out because you're going to be potentially more likely to be cattle mutilated than any other human beings. Really? Yep. Vegans are targeted. Vegans are targeted and fat children, apparently. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, I can see why you'd put that in the Plus extension. Yeah, we'll put it in the Plus extension. We'll talk about it later. That's a wrap for this show. Thank you so much for being on Plus. If you want to get access... No, you're not on Plus. You should be on Plus. You should be on Plus. If you want to get access, head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash Plus. Sign up today. You'll find all the details there. You get access to the big extensions we do every single Friday. And of course, if you're on our Emmy Max tier, you get access to our entire back catalog, which is going all the way back to, what, 2006, 2007. So years and years of shows of Mysterious Universe available for our MU Max members. Again, check it out, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. You get access to the big extensions we do every single Friday. And of course, plus members get an exclusive show that comes out every single Tuesday as well. So if you want more Mysterious Universe, that's the way to do it, mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Nine bucks a month helps support your favorite show. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. Thanks for listening. If you're on plus, stick around for the great stuff after the break for everyone else. We'll catch you next week. Thank you.